We have heard and preached in this pulpit time after time that this is the time and the hour for revival in this church. If we're challenge you tonight to embrace your destiny, to embrace what God has for your life for your family's life. Take hold of what God has for you. Don't hold anything back. What I see in the hearts of every single one that is here, I see history makers in this place. I see people, if they had their mind made up, they could change history. The history of Virginia Beach, the history of your family, the history of people that you encounter every day, but will you do it? That is the question. Because there is three types of people in this world. Those who watch it happen, those who wonder what happened, and those who will make it happen. See, destiny is not a matter of chance. It is a matter of choice. And it's the moments of decisions, small decisions, that your destiny will be shaped. It's decisions that you make every day on your jobs and when you wake up in the morning. That's what will shape your destiny. If you're wanting to do something for God, but you don't ever pray every day, your destiny to do something for God is not about to happen unless you put him as a priority. Amen? The people of Israel in Joshua's day was serving God half-heartedly. This is such a familiar scripture, but I want to bring it to your attention today. In Joshua 24, 15, it says, And if it seemed evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were, in, were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. This is Joshua speaking to the people. But this is what Joshua says. But as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. I don't know about you, but I wonder if there would be a Joshua type of mentality that would enter into the hearts of the men and women that are in this place that says, I don't know what my... Cousins, my mom, my dad, my co-workers are going to do. But as for me, in my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. Because my destiny is in my hands. My destiny and what I accomplish is in my own hands. No one is going to make the decisions for me or for you. If you're wanting to serve God and get all that you can for God, I can't make that decision for you. You have to make up your mind that I'm going to get all that I can for God, that I'm going to do everything that I can for him. This is not the time and the hour to quit. This is not the time and the hour to give in. See, Joshua made it known to the people, I'm not a quitter. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give in and throw in the towel. You know why? Because his family mattered. His children mattered. Men, women, come on, let's not be quitters. Quitter is not an option. Quitting is never an option. As I walk down the memory lanes of my own life, I'm so thankful that there was a bishop and a bishop's wife that never threw in the towel when they were at an Emmanuel Tabernacle. Come on, I know there were some tough times in their life. I know people did them wrong. But you know what? They never gave up. They never quit. And because they didn't, they met a Jerry in June that was my father and my mother. And guess what they did? My father and mother has impacted my life. I've seen true Christianity from my own home. But what if a man left the city? My parents may not have been reached to the, to the ability that they are today. And the bishop birthed a son that is now our pastor. And this man and this woman has impacted my life. But it's because of man. It's because of a man and woman that says, I'm not going to quit. 
I'm going to serve God with everything that's within me. You see, they took it upon themselves to embrace their destiny. They said, you know what? God's got a calling on my life. Come on, I'm going to embrace it. I'm going to take hold to it. So that's the reminder and the challenge tonight. Embrace your, your, embrace your destiny like the leaders that are in this church, like the men and women that you um, hold up to. Embrace your destiny. You see, when you embrace your destiny, you will always impact people. Come on, we can look at men and women that Pastor and Sister Christian have impacted all around the world. We can look at my brother Taylor, a man that's been faithful to God. He's impacted people. But you know why? Because he made up his mind that I'm going to control my destiny. I'm going to embrace my destiny. See, life is so short. And what we do for God matters. Hear me tonight. I know this is simple and plain talk, but I'm just sharing what I feel God's given me. What we do for God matters. What we do in our family matters. What we, do, what we show in church better be what we show in home because it matters. It matters because your children are watching. Because I know we're in a generation where it's so easy to be selfish. It's so easy to uh, just worry about ourselves. But I wonder if we have the mentality that we are one another's brothers keepers and sisters keepers. Come on, I, I cannot save someone, but guess what I can do? I can play a huge role in making sure that person's saved by reaching out to them, by praying for them, by, by reaching out and seeing how they're doing. Because I want them to be saved. Because people being saved matters to God. And it ought to matter to us. Because in reality, people want what you and I have. They want the hope that we have. They want the joy that we have. They want the purpose in which we live in tonight. As I was studying, I came across this letter that I'm going to read to you. The letter begins with, to whom it may concern. I'm going to leave this to whoever stumbles across my bookmark later on says, I hate myself, and I hate living. I let everyone down, and I feel as though I will never change or even improve. I've come to believe that my life has all been meaningless. I keep trying, and I keep failing. I have thought about and attempted suicide many times in the past. I thought that I would never be able to describe why. I want to do this, and I'm right. There's no way to tell you or anyone else why I dread every day. I want my life to end. I'm tired of messing everything up. The hate rages full force towards me and only me. I have long forgiven those who have hurt me, but I have not and cannot come to terms to forgive myself for the things I have done to myself in the things I've done to hurt those in my life. I hope you can find it in your heart to see, see it as a way for me not to suffer anymore and that I'm finally at rest with myself for being at rest with the guilt that constantly aches at my soul for so long. Please forgive me all for taking my own life so early. I tried so hard to fight against the strong battle. I have reached out for help so many times, and yet I believe I was turned away because of the things I did, and that is a punishment I am willing to take. For I know that being who I am has only brought myself and others pain. Love always and forever. As for my signature, I will leave you with the quote that says, I can't feel pain if you're dead, just saying. This was written by a teen from Florida just before he died of overdosing in drugs. I was moved when I read this letter. A young boy was in pain, looking for hope, looking for someone just to love him, to care for him. See, people that we encounter every day are dealing with thoughts like this, and they're wanting to be accepted. They're wanting to feel important. 
Come on, they're wanting to have some type of purpose in their life. They're wanting to feel valuable and have some peace of mind. But honestly, people don't know where to go. How can they find their answers in the world that only will let them down? Come on, how, trying to find love in a world that is selfish and yet even help, hateful. Trying to find direction in a world that is so misguided. Trying to find happiness and feel secure in a world that only gives you a false sense of security. Trying to find hope in life, so faith in that what the world can offer. But in the end, the world only lets them down. They're trying to find a peace of mind. But how can you find peace in a world that's so confused? See, it's easy to feel fearful and desperate when you don't have the answers to life problems. But guess what? Here tonight, I'm here to tell you we have the answer. And that name is Jesus. That name is Jesus. And you and I bear the responsibility to share it to one another and to those that are hurting. See, God has put in mankind a space in the inner man that only he can feel. See, people are hungry to feel that, to feel that void, and they'll try it through sex and drugs and things of the world, but it will never feel that void. They will do whatever it takes to fill that void. I looked up this statistic according to IBISworld.com. Last year, April 9th, 2021, there was over $2.2 billion spent on psychic service services last year, which is a spiritual type of reading. Don't tell me people aren't looking for something to be filled in the inside. Come on, they're looking for some type of direction. And people want what we have. And they need what we have. They want the hope. See, I want to encourage someone tonight and remind us what we do have. I think oftentimes if we're not careful, we can forget what we have in God. Come on. It can be a dangerous place if we let what we have lose its value. Come on. Having the spirit that lives inside of us, we can't forget the value that that brings to the table. When we're hurting, guess what? We can pray and talk to a God that cares. Come on. We have people that we can reach out to in church. Guess what? And we know that they're going to love and care for us. Come on, we can't forget what we have in God. But let me encourage you tonight. The Bible says in Isaiah 55, 11, it says, The word of God will never return void. That means the word of God is true. The word of God cannot be false. If he said it, it will do it. Let me remind you what the Bible says in John 6, 35. And it says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. And he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Come on, if we believe that, that Jesus is the bread of life. Come on, we need to remind us that when we're waking up every day, come on, and we got everything on our mind, Jesus is the bread of life. He's what I need every day. And we read such common scripture, and we quote it all the time in Jeremiah, where it talks about how, how God formed them in the belly. Aren't you so thankful that God knew who you are? That you're not just some accident. Come on, that God just didn't think of you as a whim, but he had a plan and a purpose for you. You're not an accident. God knows what he's doing in your life, and he's got great plans for you. Not only does God have plans for us, God is for us. Come on, God is for us. God is for us. The Bible says in Romans 8, 31, it says, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, then who can be against us? Come on, what if that teenager would have had that verse that he could hold on to? If God be for me, who could be against me? No matter what we go through, we can have this confidence that God is for us, that God is on our side. No matter what we go through, Lastly, I want to encourage you that God's given us the peace of mind. I don't know about you, but I like to have a peace of mind. I like to rest at night knowing that everything's going to be okay. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God, which path of all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. 
This is what people want. And that's just a small example of what we have. But we have so much to offer. Why not share it to those that are hurting? As we read earlier in our opening text, Jonah was called by God to none of us. Most of us already probably know the story, but he runs from very, the very presence of God. He runs from the very calling of God in his life. And he goes the opposite direction to the city of Tarsus out of the will of God. And we know the story. The storm comes, and Jonah knows that the storm is a direct result of him not obeying the will of God. In the lives of everyone, the lives of everyone's life, on that boat was in jeopardy. Let me pause real quick and tell you the eternity of others and whether they are saved are, are, not, are often dependent on if you will answer the call. Do you hear that? Some people's lives in eternity, come on, are banking on if you will answer the call. See, sometimes God may allow a storm or a trial in your life so that he can get you back in his will, not just to save you, but to save others, to save your coworker, to save those person, people on your job. That's why it's so important to be in the will of God. So you may feel a little bit like Jonah tonight. You know that God has a hand on your life, and he saved you from many things, but maybe you're struggling to stay committed and completely committed to God. Maybe you're here tonight, and you're struggling with just being disciplined and being faithful to God. Perhaps maybe that you're still battling a sin, something that's just keeping you from drawing closer to God. Maybe you're here tonight and you're an elder or someone that's been around for a long time. And, and you know what it's like to be in the mountaintops. But you, but you feel that you're even at the bottom in your, in the, your spirit tonight. Let me encourage you tonight. Tonight is a time of decision. To say, you know what, I'm tired of thinking that way. Come on, I'm tired of going that way. I am going to embrace my destiny and what God has for my life. Because your enemy, hear me tonight, your enemy is going to do whatever he can to distract you from answering the call of God on your life. Or just being what God has called you. He's going to do whatever he can do in your life to get you from not being connected to God. The Bible says in Jonah 2, verse 5, we read it. It says, the waters come past me about, even to the soul, the depths closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I think it's very interesting that the Bible doesn't say the weeds were wrapped around my body. But it says it was wrapped around his head. There are numerous stories of the danger of diving and swimming amongst weeds. When a swimmer gets caught in the weeds, they often find themselves panicking. And the more panic they get, the more they keep swimming to try to get out. But what they don't know is the more that they swim, the more that they get entangled into the weed. And before you know it, the weeds have choked them, and they end up drowning because of the weeds. I want to tell you what I feel in the spirit when I read this. See, when you're at a point of decision in your life, the enemy is going to do whatever he can do to come after your mind, to come after your head. And he's going to try to entangle you with the affairs of this life, the busyness of this life. Come on, the getting all up in your feelings type of way in your life where you, where you don't focus on the things that you need to focus. And what happens is he begins, he begins to choke your self-worth and he begins to choke your faith that you have. And before you know it, you lost your purpose. You lost what God has for you. See, your self-worth is so low that you feel like you're not good enough because maybe you didn't pray enough. Maybe you didn't come to church enough. And he starts playing with your mind. And you feel like you're not valuable to God anymore. And you're not important to him. See, and the devil knows if he can get your mind, he's going to get your heart. And if he gets your heart, he's going to get your soul. See, that's why he's going to do whatever he can to attack your mind. And he'll get you so focused on your promise 
that you forget the one that can solve all your problems. We get so caught up in the everyday life and the busyness of life. We get caught up and we get entangled in the affairs of this life that we miss out on what God has for you and I. Let me remind you tonight, there is nothing the enemy can do without God's permission. Nothing. When the enemy attacks your mind, he has to get permission from God. Hear me tonight. There's not anything the enemy can do. The Bible says it's such a familiar scripture in Isaiah 59, 19. It talks about when the enemy comes in like the flood. What does the Bible say? He raises up a standard against him. That no matter what you're going through, God says, you know what, I'm going to provide a standard. I'm going to put a wall for you in a time of need. I read this first. I thought it was very interesting. In Psalms 29.10, it says, the Lord sitteth upon the flood. The Lord sitteth king forever. Not only does God raise a standard, God has the power over the flood. Meaning that no matter what situation you go in, God can say, you know, you can't touch him. Come on, you can't touch him in that area. You can't touch my, my son, my family. You cannot touch those people in Virginia Beach. They, they've got a call, and God's got great plans for their life. But tonight I want to ask the question, what's holding you back from embracing your destiny? What is controlling you? from being what God wants you to be in your life. See, we allow silly things to get in our life sometimes to control us. Come on. When it comes to waking up on Sunday morning, we say, you know, I'm tired. In all reality, if you had to work, guess what? We'd be up working. We just allow silly things to get in the way when it comes to the things of God. If we could put that that slide on the screen, I want to look at this. You guys probably have seen this before. But sometimes the things that are holding you back is all in your head. It's all in your head. God's got great things for your life. God's got great things for this church. But sometimes we got to get out of our own way. and We got to believe that God's going to do it through us and for this church and not allow our own self to dictate what happens. But we need to learn to put our trust in God. See, God is wanting us to be free and roam in the spirit, but we can't get in our way. He's wanting us to live a victorious life and not allow these little things to get in our way, little offenses, little doubts, little fears, you know, when your wife gets on your nerves or, you know what I mean, anything like that. Sometimes we allow even those to get in our way from what God wants us to be. Let us not be entangled tonight. You may say, preacher, I've tried to get over it. I've just done all that I can. I don't have the faith anymore. Come on, I don't know how to control things. I don't know how to do this. I don't even know how to make it when obstacles come my way. I want us to look at Jonah. What did Jonah do when he faced with obstacles? Can you imagine being in a belly three days with the seaweed and the guts and who knows what's in all that belly there? But what does Jonah do? Let's let's look at verse 7. Jonah 2, verse 7. This is what he said. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple. In the time of difficulties, why don't we take a step and remember the Lord? Remember what God has done for you. Remember where God has brought you from. Remember when you were in a pig pit. Remember when you were struggling with different issues in your life and maybe you came from abuse and all that junk. Remember where God brought you from. Remember the mercy and the grace that God had towards you when you sinned knowingly, when you know it was wrong. God still loved you and he still cared for you. Remember the times that God met you. Come on, we've all had those moments. Come on, those dark times, those lonely times when you're crying in your car, when you're crying in your bed and you don't know where to go or where to turn to, and it feels like life has overtaken you, let me encourage the church, remember the Lord, because the Lord is with you, and the Lord is on your side. It reminds me of the story 
of Aleda. Aleda, she was a woman who had been a smoker for over 50 years. And she said for 50 years she had been trying to quit. And it wasn't until Leah, Leah John, at the age of 79, proposed marriage. But he refused to go through with the wedding until she stopped smoking. And when she was later asked about the habit, she said, willpower was never enough to get me off the habit. But she said, love did. Love got me out of the habit. We may not have the strength or even the power to feel like we can make a difference or even overcome our habits or circumstance. But let the love of God, let the love of God be what drives us to overtake anything that we may face. See, Jonah, I know you're in the belly of the fish. I know you're disappointed, God. I know that you failed, but Jonah, don't ever give up. You know why? Nineveh needs you. Come on, hear that tonight. There's a Virginia Beach that needs you and I. And we can't afford to allow little things to get in the way. But we got to have the love of God be the driving force behind our actions, behind our witnessing. In the midst of turmoil and junk that Jonah was in, he remembered the love that God had for him. See, no matter what Jonah went through, guess what? God, even in his mistakes, God still had a plan, and he began to embrace his destiny. We need to love God because he first loved us. You guys can stand. I'm going to close with this illustration. It says the speech in itself has its own name. The name is a time for choosing. It was October 27th, 1964. Ronald Reagan, our former president, was doing a campaigning speech for the United States Senator Barry Goldwater. When Ronald Reagan made this powerful statement in this speech regarding the crisis that America was facing, he challenged America and he said, you and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We can preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we can sentence them to take the first step into a thousand years of darkness. We have the right to determine our own destiny. Just like the spirit behind Ronald Reagan that said, America, you have the right to determine and to preserve your children. I speak boldly in a pulpit tonight and say that you and I have the right to preserve our children in our city. You and I have to come to a place and a decision that says, my children, those around me are too valuable. I've got to embrace my destiny because there's people there that are hurting. And I don't want anybody to be lost. You and I are in a decision point tonight. You may have even made a decision today already that you're going to start to serve God, that's okay. I want to open the altars tonight. I want to ask first, before you come, that you would think about what you're coming to do. You're coming to an altar and making it known to the people around you that I'm embracing my destiny tonight. My family and I, we're embracing our destiny because there's too many souls that are at stake. There's too many lives that need to be reached. If we're going to see the potential and the growth that God has for the city, each and every one of us need to go above and beyond 
than they did before. We have to be willing to push our flesh aside and say, I'm going to embrace my destiny tonight. I'm not going to run from it. I'm not going to be like Joan and run from it. So tonight I open the altars. I want there to be a commitment tonight that I'm going to embrace the destiny that God has for me. If they begin to play music in the background, I open this altar. I want you to come with the right mind. Come on, don't, don't come because a preacher has forced you or begged you to come. I want you to come because God is pricking your heart tonight. I want you to come with a commitment more than ever before. I'm going to serve God. Come on, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I'm not going to run away from what God has for me. Because there's people in Nineveh that need to hear the word of God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Oh, God, let the Spirit of God reign in our hearts. Come on, baptize us with a fresh commitment tonight. A commitment, God, to control our destiny and put our destiny in you. In the name of Jesus.